recall that if we have some antiderivative function whose derivative is a function we're interested in, then we have this method of evaluating an integral over that function. which consists of finding the difference of the antiderivatives evaluated at the endpoints. And we have some notation to kind of simplify that. We can say big F of x at from A to B evaluated from A to B. This, this, this notation either brackets or with a line like this, meaning evaluate any derivative in this matter. Now, we've only been dealing up to now really with definite integrals. Definite integrals, I remind you, are a number, right? They're not a function. Uh, the variable here, in this case x or whatever it is, is a dummy variable. Once you evaluate it, there's no, there's no variable left. But it would be handy to have uh, a little nicer notation than to just keep referring to this antiderivative in this manner. And we have a very, very simple way to indicate that, which is to just simply write the interval sign without limits now this is not a number right? you can't tell me you know if I give you the function you can't tell me what it is because I haven't told you the limits so it certainly depends on x however it's, it's not actually a function either really a family of functions. If I were to, if I start from here, but now I say, well, when I, uh, when I evaluate this, I, I certainly get f of x, but there's always that unknown constant. Why is, why is that? Why is that there? Well, Let's find the derivative of this, right? Derivative of f prime is f of x. Derivative of c is always zero. Right? So any constant will satisfy this. Uh, it would be good if I give you a problem, like I say, well, what's the indefinite integral of this x. It'd be good for you to always think of it as plus c. Now you won't you won't have to write that all the time. Uh, sometimes a problem will come up where you have to evaluate that constant. So for example, if I said uh, what's this function f of x where f of 1 equals 2. Right now, now this is no longer a family of functions. It's a specific function, right? So I would say, OK, well, if I evaluate this at 1, I'll get 1 half plus c, that equals 2. And now I can solve for c and find that c is, you know, three halves. Okay. So that's that's a case where we tied a indefinite integral down to one specific function. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. So now, what's the connection? This is this is. One of those things that it's so obvious, it might be confusing, but this is, should be very simple. 
what is the connection between a definite integral and an indefinite integral? Right? I know these look very similar, and you're going to have to try and keep them separate in your mind. This is, remember, family functions. This is a number. The connection is, if you take this, again, it's an antiderivative, and you evaluate it at the limits, then they're equal. I. Tell me your name. Are you? Daniel. Daniel, yeah. Okay. something which notationally indicates an antiderivative. So if I say, what's the indefinite integral of x to the n dx? Of 1 over 
Yeah, this reminds me, I, I kind of forgot something here. Here, I really want to say n not equal to minus 1, yeah. Because here we are, this is obviously, we're not going to be able to use that. Okay, well, well what's the, uh, what's the anti plus here? Plus C, ln x plus C. Okay, now, that's 100% oh, if, yeah, I forgot if, value of if I want to restrict it to this interval, right? Yeah, but as soon as x is not there, we still can find, you know, this, this function, it exists on both sides of 0, but over here, what do we have to do? We have to take the absolute value. And again, if we find the derivative of this, we're just going to find our, now, now, uh, yeah, we're just going to find our way back here. Okay. Now, consider for a second something that looks like this. I'm not going to tell you what this function is. I'm just going to tell you I want the integral of the derivative of this function over the function. How do we get there? It kind of looks a little like this if you consider that the derivative of x is 1. So this is, this is kind of an example of it. Right, this is a really important pattern that you're going to run into when you're trying to work out integrals. It won't, it won't look like this. It won't say f prime of x over f. It, it might be very abstract, but you might see it in some other form. Like you might see integral of, say, 2x over 1 plus x squared. Something you may not know how to solve for. But you can see the derivative of this is 2x. So it's good to know that this integral can be evaluated as the log of the absolute value of f of x plus some constant. So this goes beyond just knowing a simple, yeah, e of the x, integral of e of the x. This is, this is more general, and it's, it's it's kind of something you want to put in your toolbox when you're evaluating integrals. Um, we're actually, over the next few weeks, we're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build up your toolbox so you can evaluate these. Okay, uh, well, let's, let's take an example here. This is my quick and dirty fix to the Blackboard, it doesn't work. Let's take a look at, uh, I think I've given this one away, but that's fine. Okay, anyone want to anyone take a stab at that? Ln of x squared plus x plus 4 plus c. I didn't tell you what the interval was. Can this ever be negative? I think this can be negative. Right? Oh, no, it can't be negative. So you don't need, you don't really need the uh, absolute values. All right, let's, uh, Let's do the right thing. Let's check this. Let's find the derivative. All right. So now we have a function of a function. We have a function of a function. What rule do you use to find the derivative? 
rule and the chain rule. Right? So the chain rule says this is going to be, well, the derivative of the log of something is 1 over. And then the chain rule says I have to multiply well, by the derivative of the interior function. Thank you. So this is just 2x plus 1. So that's our check, right? We constantly want to use the fact that, well, we don't always have a formula for finding an antiderivative. We can always check and see, once we, you know, we think we have it, that, um, sorry. OK. I have something that looks like this. F prime of x this looks a little like what we just did. Right? Times f of x to some n, n greater than 1. Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go to find what that is? Well, about something like 1 over, one over x to the n. That's really x to the n minus 1, x to the minus n. And uh, it turns out we can still use the power rule on this, can't we? Right, we can still use this. This is just x to the minus n plus 1 over minus n plus 1. And as we, as we saw before, the derivative of this function inside here is just 1. So we might think, OK, is it possible that this is f of x to the minus n plus 1 over minus n plus 1. Well, how are we going to determine whether that's correct or not? Take the derivative. OK. All right. So uh, again, we're going to use the chain rule, right? Use the power rule and then the chain rule. The derivative of f of x to the minus n plus 1 is just going to be f of x to the minus n, right? Subtract 1. So then we multiply by negative n plus 1, which cancels the denominator. And then we have to multiply once more by make the chain rule work, derivative. And that's, that's exactly what we were looking for. OK, again, uh, there are just some, some patterns here that are helpful. Uh, Take a look at an example where this might come in handy. Uh, what about the integral of x or x squared plus 1 squared? I guess 
might help to stare at that pattern for a second. see how this kind of works? We're kind of working backwards, but we're learning to see things. See how are we going to work backwards on that? Right. We're, we're not limited here to polynomials either. Uh, let's take a nice trig-oriented example. Look at the integral of the secant times the tangent. Well, my favorite strategy when you're dealing with trig functions, if you don't just see something, see something you immediately know how to do. You might, you might actually know exactly what this is because you memorized it. But I always like to convert everything to sines and cosines when possible. Because that, that often makes things clearer. So secant is what? In terms of sines and cosines. One over the cosine. And the tangent over cosine. So we're looking for sine of x over cosine of the squared of x dx. Well, does anyone see the pattern yet? My f of x here is what? Cosine of x. My n is obviously 2. And hopefully, my derivative of f of x is what? What's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Negative sine. Well, 
we have that same constant problem again, don't we? Right? We've got a negative sign, but we don't have a negative sign here. Well, that's not hard to deal with. We just take two negative signs and Now, how does this our pattern? Right? So this is just negative one over cosine of x plus. Let's not forget that constant. That's where it comes from. So this should be should be positive. All right. What's a what's a good name for one over the cosine? What did we decide? C. That's the secant. And maybe this is just you know one of those. I don't I don't I don't try and myself remember all these. It's, it's too easy to find the derivative of the secant of x. Using the quotient rule, but that's actually the root of the secant of that. The secant times tangent. Okay. Want to get our minuses in the right place? Okay. Um, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna digress a little because uh, there's something. I want to make sure everybody knows about. I know everybody took the first derivative bar calculus at some point. I want to ask a probing question here. So uh, what if I wanted to find the derivative of the inverse sine of x? Now, just offhand, has anybody had it memorized? One plus x squared. Okay, now that's good. Good thing to have it, or you know. The, in front of the back of this book, they must have a table somewhere of these guys. Does anyone remember how you show this? Implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation. You sign y equals x and then you show the implicitly differentiation. That's a good way to do it. It's not the way I was thinking of it. I mean, it, it's pretty much the same process. Though. Yeah. Anyone, anyone remember uh, this formula? Y dx equals 1 over dx dy. Now, I think I, I've said this before. You've got to be careful when you're dealing with these expressions. 
these are not fractions. It just looks like they could be fractions, doesn't it? This says the derivative of a function is 1 over the derivative of the inverse function. So if we want to find this, we set this equal to y. And what we have is that x equals the sine of y. And the derivative, the x dy, of this is going to be, of course, cosine of y. So that tells me that the derivative of the inverse sine is 1 over the cosine of y. But I, I really don't I really don't want this expression in terms of y, I want it in terms of x. So I use my Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared of x is 1 minus sine squared, or the cosine of x is going to be the square root of 1 minus sine squared of x, right? So that's how we get that, one of the ways we can get that point. Uh, I never tried with implicit differentiation, I'm sure that works just fine. It's a bit more good. It's a bit more good. Okay. Well, I buy that. Okay, so uh, that tells me what to do if I have something with this pattern, which is the prime of x over the square root of 1 minus f of x squared. Are you going to see how that works? This is just going to be the inverse sine of f of x plus c. So you can start to you can start to kind of see the landscape here. Which is all these things you found the derivative of. All these formulas. If you look at them abstractly, you know, instead of sine of x, sine of a function of x, <coughs> using the chain rule, you can kind of see there's some pattern here that, that you're going to be able to go back and forth to. Again, this is just a this is just a tool. Um, <coughs> Let's have an example here. Uh, what if I said, what is the indefinite integral of x over 1 minus x to the fourth dx? Okay. How we kind of jam this into here? Right. What would be a, a what would be a uh, a good guess for what the f of x I want to use is here. Okay. So if f of x is x squared, f prime of x is 2x, right? Well, again, we don't have 2x here, so we're just going to use that very simple trick of And this gives us one half of what? Inverse sine of x squared plus our constants. Okay. Um, I want to show you one more technique that the book emphasizes. 
I think is important. And then we're gonna we're gonna do some we're gonna do some examples here. Uh, yeah. So, uh, technique. Is used when you have a rational function. Uh, for example, integral This is right from the book, but I like the example. And uh, they actually express this as a definite integral. It's just, just, just going to make our knuckles bleed at the end a little bit here. But clearly, the first thing I want to do is find the antiderivative. Um, I guess maybe I'll write it this way. Let's find the antiderivative. Let's find the indefinite integral, and then we'll evaluate it from one to nine. So the suggestion is, and it example like this is to first simplify the rational expression as follows. Let's break this down into 2t squared over t squared, so it's just 2 plus 2t two squared square root of t, which is just over t squared, which is just square root of t, which I like to write as t to the half, so I can use the power rule, and then minus 1 over t squared. Uh, okay, so this looks much easier to evaluate. Uh, the antiderivative of 2 is just going to be 2t. Antiderivative of t to the 1 half is going to be t to the 3 halves. Divided by three halves, or multiplied by two thirds. And now we have, yeah, I think I'm going to write it this way, t to the minus two. This just becomes t to the minus one divided by what? Minus one. There goes my negative sign. Okay. Now comes the uh, knuckle bleeding part here. So we want to evaluate this at 9. So 2 times 9 is 18. t to the 3 halves evaluated at 9. Oh, well, that's the square root. It's 3 and then q, 27. Divided by 3 again is 9. Times 2 is 18. Now, this is just one ninth, right? Plus one ninth. Now we have to subtract all this, evaluate it at one. So we've got a two and two thirds. Six minus three is thirty-three. Let me see what I did. Took all the whole numbers, and then I have plus one ninth minus two thirds. So I think it's thirty-two plus one and nine is ten ninths minus six ninths. So thirty-two and four ninths. Did I get that right? Okay, so the you know again the kernel of wisdom here is it helps to simplify quantum use. Alright, are there any questions up till now? Anybody come in while I was I didn't notice? I saw I got I got you. Okay, uh, I have a worksheet here. Um, again, if you'll see it says on here. Uh, exactly. Um, I 
think when you get to number three, if you don't know what to do, raise your hand. Um, you have it already. For 5.3? Okay. And I think uh, we can work on this for maybe five or ten minutes and take a break. You're certainly encouraged if you wish to work with other people on these. Again, this is like homework, just practice. So if it helps, it helps. I just got your email, John, oh. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Okay.
Brandon is not here, right? No. Number four, the denominator should be that whole quantity to the fifth, not the x to the fifth. See? I mean, I have to go along with the book, but I mean, you would always write it this way. Or you would write. I mean, those are, it's clear. But what does this mean? I, I kind of think that it's like that. Hmm? It's not x to the fifth. No. I mean, the problem I gave you is not that. I wrote it this way, but I meant this. So. Um, You know, I, I, I think the reason, though, is it has something to do with, uh, I think I told you guys my background is programming. Right? And if you're a computer programmer, everything within the parentheses is the argument. Right? But I guess if you're a mathematician, that's, that might not be so. You might just say, this is the argument, in which case, all right, I'll try not to do that ever again, <laughs> especially on tests in business. So, do you feel like you know what's going on here? I'll be here a little after class, too, if you have any questions. Okay. You, you, did you just take 1A? Yeah. Okay.
All right, um, why don't you take a break, if you wish, for a five, maybe ten minutes, and then we'll come back. So bang your head you get things a little, okay? There's also a great opportunity for anybody who's having a lot of trouble to come up and ask you Oh, 
that's that's for their version. Yeah, yeah. 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 uh, you have to take pieces rather than do the whole thing. But it's doing it, you know, mechanically, uh, computationally, right? It's not doing it in what we call closed form. And there may be problems on a test or a quiz where I say exact. And if you do this, you might not get the answer. And I'll know you did it the wrong way because if you don't get the exact answer, right? right. Yeah. So, what do you can do it again? Second tower. And then number seven, see it's the integral sign. Yes. Did I not? Is that? You're sitting over there, right? Yeah. And turn back your phone. Yes. Question. I'm sorry? Oh. Okay. Do these two are 
Yes. Thank you. 
track of those minuses, don't you? Does that sound like what people got? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bobby. Um, there's, you know, a lesson for everybody, which is, you know, it's always good to check your work, right? It's better to check it a different way than you did the first time. That's possible. Like, for example, one thing, one thing you'll be able to do exam, even though I might give you a problem where I want an exact answer, like has a pie in it, right? You could still, you could get in here, let's see, we'll put in uh, x plus 1, 
I put, putting this on the overhead because I'm being lazy, but x minus 1. And I'm going to use my calc function, SF4, second F4, and evaluate it from minus 2 to 3. And it says, this is what I, this is the answer I get. Is 6.666. I guess this one is dead now. 6.666. They had a key to that to do it over again. Well, something like this. Which, if you wrote this answer down, and if I was saying, you know, I want an exact answer. This would not be good, right? But as a check, you certainly can see that that's what, you know. Now, if it turns out different, if it's, if it's like this, then you know, aha, I must have done something wrong. So it's always, again, it's always good to check. All right, now we come to, what did someone, should we say number three? So it said that was the hardest one? Hmm? You want to do it? Okay. You can do it now, but you have to explain what you're doing because there's something hard about this and everybody needs to understand how to do it. Yeah, put down. So this is almost the same problem. I, I changed, the reason I changed the limit on it was I, I thought there was already too much, you know, too much stress on your knuckles. So I made it a little easier, but it still has the same basic problem. Yeah. What's the, what's the problem with this problem? This here is that you're taking the integral of an absolute value of a function. So the function turns out if it were supposed to be like this, it's going to have become like this around the same points that it had this here. Okay, I, I understood what you said, but I want to make sure everybody else understands what you're saying there. Yeah. Nice. In other words, we, we manipulate the previous problem and we don't want to count the negative area as negative area anymore. We want to make it positive area. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? You're going to have to separate the integral wherever it, the negative portion is supposed to be positive. It becomes negative with the integral 1, negative 1. Okay. So you're going to have to take Okay, so, so that one is a kind of a critical point. And how do we find that point? What is it about that point that, that makes us realize that that's where it goes from negative to positive? Because it's a factor of... What happens to the function at that point? It becomes negative at that point. On one side of the point, it's negative. Yeah. On the other side, it's positive. What happens at that one point? It's zero. It's zero. So you want to see, if you get a problem like this, you want to divide it up. You want to find out where does the function switch, which is exactly where it's zero. Uh, which thankfully is something you've been doing since Algebra 1, right? Finding out where some polynomial is 0. Uh, by the way, where, where is this function 0? I mean, yeah, where does it become 0? You can just look at it and see, right? 1 and negative 1. Now, if I had left the, the lower
lower bound, the minus 2, then you'd see you'd actually have to do three separate pieces. And I thought that was way too much crazy calculation. So, okay. Okay. Questions or comments? Thank you. So everybody, this is actually a nice diagram here. It shows pretty clearly that from minus one to one, this is below the line, but since we're doing the absolute value, we're not going to treat that as negative area. And then from 1 to 3. Um, I suppose we should check this, shouldn't we? That's right. That's right, we should check it, or it's right? It's we checked it, it's right. I'm 
just I'm just gonna be dumb and I'm just gonna plug in minus one to what was the other bound? Three? And it says it says eight. Okay. ask you a question here. So this is, uh, this is x squared plus x squared minus 1, right? Mm -hmm. So the... No, wait, whoops. That's nice. Okay. Uh, well, now the interesting thing is here, there's a little mistake that nobody else picked up on, but which doesn't seem to hurt the answer. It is the way, though. Well, it's the I way. wrote it up wrong. But it's the way. It's still eight. Right. Right, let's, let's, I did this with the so we plug in three here, and we get 27 6. Oh, it's not plus two thirds. Oh, I see why. Yeah, it's, this is, so here we're going to have minus three. And over here, we're going to have plus three.
did a good job, thank you. And, 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 and actually, it's better when a student makes a mistake, not, not for their own self-esteem, because of course there's a little embarrassment there. Just so everybody knows that every, anybody here, even I will make mistakes. If, if you don't catch a mistake, be doing a mistake before this semester is off, over, it's because you slept through class, right? Um, you see something like this, and though I did, the, yeah, this is the one I did that on. And you don't want to panic, right? You know, big numbers will panic people. Something they haven't seen before will panic people. And the trick is to just say, First I go, you know, this is going to be simple once I figure it out. Right? So, would someone like to do this one? Uh, okay. No, no. <laughs> no you, you've already, you've got an A plus for effort today. Plus, plus you created that so-called teachable moment. Somebody who's not so great, come on. Right? I'll help you, I'll help you, come on. Right, so. So what's the function, and what's the function we want to kind of pull out of this thing here? Sine of x. You see, it's that simple, go ahead. Now everything's going to follow, right? So f of x is sine of x. What's, what's the derivative of sine of x? Okay, good. Okay, so if you rewrite that thing up there in terms of f of x and f prime of x, what do you get? That's, that's f prime of x and that's f of x to the fifth, right? Just write it down that way. And here we have that that pattern. So Did you know how to do that before you went up there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Well, you, don't get, you only get an A, not an A plus. All right. Good. I mean, does everyone see, see, see the point? It's, like, it's intimidating because you've got sines and cosines, but it's really just a function to a power and it's derivative. And uh, when faced with something like that, if you like go, oh my god, it's too complicated, you're not going to get it. But if you go, wait a minute now, this is just calculus B. It's not calculus D or advanced <coughs> something. Everything here is doable. There may be a problem, there may be, you know, if I think of a problem which I think most people won't get on the, on the quiz. I'll make it an extra credit, right? Because I'm not here to, to fool you. Um, very nice, Matthew. Okay. Uh, I think six is, is almost an even better example of this. Uh, don't because he's really quick. this look like? And you shouldn't even... You shouldn't really need to strain your brain. What does that look like? Arc sign. Arc sign, yeah. But I, I guess what I meant is, what you mean is it looks like this, which is the... Right? 
So really what we just need to do is think that f of x is e to the x, f prime of x is e to the x, and suddenly this is f of x 1 over the square root of, over the square root of 1 minus f of x squared. F prime. Hang on. Dx. And now, from this pattern, we can see that this is just going to be the inverse sine of f of x plus c, which itself is kind of a bizarre construction. I don't know where that was going to come up in physics, or we don't care in math, right? All right. Uh, the homework is online. I guess I should put that up for anybody who wants to write it down. Uh, it's just going to give you some practice. So, I guess it's, uh, I'm going to put it up over here. Um, we're not done today. I'll just page three six three five point three, and again you can just look up on the web. But one four eight twelve fourteen eighteen twenty eight and thirty. Okay. Um, that's how you're going to learn how to do these. Is do a bunch of them. Oh, well, you know, I skipped over five. Does anybody want me to show five? Is everybody happy with five? That was the simplify it first problem. Okay. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk for a minute about uh, how we can use what we've done to think about certain kinds of problems. Uh, okay, so first kind of problem is something that the book calls net change. And the idea is, well, we're going to start with something we know, which is that we can evaluate this definite integral by evaluating the antiderivative at the endpoints. And since we know that the derivative of that antiderivative is just a function, we can, can rewrite it this way. So what we want you to think about what I want you to think about is that this function is telling us something about the, you know the vector process. We're looking at the value of this function at some place. That's what f of x is. Right? So the derivative of f of x is its rate of change. So what we're doing is we're evaluating a function which is a rate of change over, over some interval. Now, I just said that and I don't even think I understood what I said. It's a little too abstract. So, um, <coughs> Let's take it in terms of a real problem. This is, again, a problem out of the book, but I like it. Um, consider uh, we have uh, we 
you have a reservoir with water in it, and uh, water flows in and water flows out, and uh, we're going to think of that rate of change of water as derivative of some function. B. So what this tells us is that if we evaluate from between two different times, if we integrate this rate of change, in other words, how fast the water is flowing in or out, What that tells us is that this function is merely telling us how much water is in the reservoir at a particular time, and that, oh, I guess I'm going to use B, not F, right? Where B is now the amount of water in the reservoir, and this integration is just looking at difference between two different times. In other words, we're looking at the net change in the amount of water. I don't know if that really helps. It's kind of asking me a question. Well, so that's one kind of problem you're going to see. So um, I don't really know what else to say about that. This is just this is just one way to look at what we've been talking about. Which is to see that uh, it's not just a function, it actually can be some kind of real world <coughs> measurement. All right. I, didn't, I didn't really like that at all, but I'm, I'll leave it to you to ask me a question if you don't know what I'm talking about. You can laugh too. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I've been in this place before, so. All right. Uh, let's, look, let's take a look at another uh, another kind of real world kind of example. Uh, this is actually going to mimic problems two and three a little bit. Uh, consider you have uh, some kind of railroad track. Straight. And you have a train, a very nondescript train going back and forth on this. And uh, travels at some velocity. Now, if we were to uh, If we were to integrate this velocity from time one to time two, just just this way, Let, let's think about what this means for a second. But, but first, I, I have to give you some kind of idea, like what's happening to it. So at some point. Uh, starts moving in one direction, and then it slows down to zero, it goes in another direction, and it speeds up, and then finally it stops again. This is its velocity now, right? This time. So when I integrate this, what am I integrating? I 
I have kind of an area here, which we'll call that A1. And then there's another area here, A2, which is, is negative, right? In other words, I was going, I was speeding up, I slow down, and I go to zero. And I turn around, I speed up, and I go back to zero, and I do this again. So what I'm getting here is the sum of these areas. Well, I'm going to write it this way to be clear. In other words, A1 and A3 are in this direction and have a positive contribution, but A2 is in this direction, so it has a negative contribution. So this is what we would call the displacement. This would be the displacement of the train, right? So tell us where the train is. But maybe we're not interested in that. Maybe what we're really interested in is how far did the train go, right? So if these two are equal, when you get to here, you're, you're back at your starting point. You're back at zero. But that doesn't, you still don't know how far you went. So in that case, What you'd want to measure is not the integral over v. In that case, you would want to evaluate the integral over the absolute value of t. Right now, instead my graph kind of looks like this. So here's my a1, my a2, a3. And this integral is the sum of these. And so this is not the displacement, it's the distance, or the distance traveled. You want to think about that when you're solving a real world problem. What am I interested in? Am I interested in how far something went, or where did it end up? Right. Likewise, you know, in the water problem, maybe I'm interested in how much water is sloshing back and forth through the tubes, right? Or maybe I'm not interested in that. Maybe I'm interested in how much water is in the reservoir. So there's two different types of problems that you might run into. Uh, okay, so here's a particular problem similar to both of these that we're going to look at. Uh, so, uh, again, this is a problem from the book. You want to take a look there, too. Uh, Problem involves a particle. Sounds a little vague, but any people interested in physics here? Physicists? No physicists. No. Well, physicists are always interested in particles. And this particle, for whatever reason, has a velocity. Usually, when there are forces on a particle, its velocity is subject to an acceleration, which usually is only a square, but, which isn't a square, it's just, uh, just the power of one. But something about this particle causing its velocity to, be, to vary with the uh, square. Okay, so uh, at Time zero, this is at negative six, right? At time one, I guess we don't really care about zero, it's at negative four. And at time four, it 
expect 12 minus 6 at position 6, right? So we want to find two things here. We want to find its displacement. This is velocity for it. We want to find its displacement, and you also want to find how far it travels. All right. So six. Hmm? Yeah. Isn't it negative six at one? Because you have one minus one is zero, and then minus six. Thank you. You already found. You you already found this error, right? Okay. I don't know if anybody else noticed. Uh, if they didn't, they're they're asleep. Right. Okay, so so what expression would give me, first of all, the displacement? Right? What do I want to integrate here? T to zero from the uh, Actually, you know, in this particular problem, we want to know we don't care about zero. We care about minus one. But we care about one. We want to we want to integrate from one second to four seconds, right? At which time it's going to go from, its velocity will go from minus six to six. All right, so what's the expression that goes in here? T squared minus T minus six. So this is pretty straightforward. We've been doing a lot of this, right? This is just T cubed over three minus squared over 2 minus 6 t from 1 to 4. And then there's some ugly numbers here. 4 over 3 minus 16 over 2 minus 24 minus 1 third minus 1 half minus 6. And if you're uh, Careful about this, you get minus nine minutes. Okay. That just tells you where you are, right? That just tells you where the particle is. But how far did it go, right? Clearly, if it's gone from negative six to six, it's at a negative velocity and a positive. Integration is now kind of canceling. Actually, this is a little bigger because it's minus. So, what would my expression be for the displacement over that same time period? So we did a problem like this, right? And what did we have to do to solve it? Figure out the sine first in the function. We have to find out where the function, in this case, v is zero. All right. T squared minus t minus six equals zero. How do I uh, how do I find the zeros of that? It's really late in the day, I can tell, because even now our Algebra 2 abilities have flown out the window. <laughs> you get this in Algebra, algebra or Advanced Algebra. We can, we can factor this. T plus 2, T negative 3. T plus 2, T minus 3. Does anybody have a problem with this? Doing this. I mean, if you do, and you happen to remember the clock center. No. Quadratic formula, yes. Quadratic formula will always give it to you, right? Raise your hand if you don't want me to call on you. 
or a site of quadratic form? Nobody's raising checkers. I'm not going to do that. In high school, when I'd ask someone to do that, they, they'd sing it. <laughs> okay. So places where this is 0 are negative 2 and 3. I guess I should put them in brackets. Solution set. Okay. So uh, negative 2 isn't a problem, is it? But 3 is. It switches in 3. So we really have to break this down to 1 to 3. And 3 to 4. OK, this is, if you try and do this uh, with a calculator, you risk the possibility of uh, getting an inaccurate answer. If you do it without a calculator, you risk the possibility of, you know, bloodying your numbers. So I won't make I won't make you do this. Um, but I guess you know I guess we've hammered that pearl of wisdom. Okay, I think that's I don't know what it is. I guess it's because it's a small class. I guess you guys are too smart, that's the problem. Right? I don't really have much else today. I will stick around for those who have questions about the handout, homework, and their future in this class, just that showed up, or anything else you want to talk about. This kind of 
overpowers, at this point, this overpowers that area. And at this point, this overpowers that. It's at, so it's at that point, seven, which is the local minimum. And then finally, after all this area is added well, in. I don't know if the sum of this is two. Well, I'm looking, and that looks smaller than that. Okay. It looks, looks bigger in Greek. It's yeah. Bigger. And that looks even bigger than that. And this looks bigger than that. Well, I think it's positive, and oh, then it goes negative, and then it goes positive. And I think the area here is negative again. Because I think this is at least as big as this. It looks a little bigger, and this is bigger than that. So it's a very, very much more negative. Okay. Right. So that's where the local max and min occur. Okay. Where does G attain its absolute maximum value? By which I assume they mean its max. Oh. I don't know what they mean by that. Where does G attain its absolute maximum value? Do they mean the max in the value of the? I mean, it's just like the value of T at which this Well, see, I don't, I mean, well, that, how is that question different? Local max. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different question. This is asking for a local max in the local minimum. Remember the difference? Yeah, so the, the responses that I had for the, the local maximum is that it was at one, and it was at three. It was at one, and it was at three, and then it was at five. Well, the minimums. Local minimum is zero. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Sorry, I forgot that one. <laughs> right. And then there's a local minimum of three. But isn't there a um, local maximum that? And then there's a local minimum at seven. Isn't there a local maximum at one? Yes. And then there's another one at uh, five. And another one at set. Oh, now I understand. Okay, going no, for. I'm sorry? What about three? Well, three is a minimum, a local so minimum. Minute, yeah. And then seven would be a local minimum. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So that's just the local ones. Yeah. And then they want the absolute maximum. That's got to be a nullity. That's what this is a, this is about visualizing something difficult. So that's okay. <laughs> right? Um, what we might try and do we might try and do are you gonna like on the quiz? Do are you probably not? Because yeah, I don't I don't like to. I mean I think this is perfectly okay, okay as a something to think about. I mean, it, it helps if you have this kind of understanding, but let me see if I can draw this carefully. Okay, so let's try and think about integrating this, right? It starts at zero, so it kind of increases to 
going down quicker because this, this kind of increases quicker. So at some point here where this area equals this area, this is zero. And then as it gets to here, it's, it's, well, it's not, okay, maybe those are equal. I mean, it's somewhere, somewhere between here and here, it goes to zero. And then, then it, it's it's increasing quickly, but then at this point now, its increase has gone to zero. This is hard to see this, right? This is this point here, right? And then again, it, you know, somewhere along here, you know, this plus this plus this is zero, and it's kind of going up. And then it's this point. Again, this kind of takes over and puts down here. So, right. And, and actually, oh, yeah, oh, so it's not actually because it's like it kind of looks like, but it kind of goes down. It's like really shifty. Yeah, yeah, except it's expanding. Okay. So, where does it gain its maximum? Well, it's okay. This part is kind of. Yeah, but right. I guess so that's going to be its maximum value. The, these two are local max, right? These are local min, local min. And now when it says on what interval is it concave down? So here, here, and here, here, and here. Yeah, here, here. Okay, this gets the graph letter. <laughs> this is this is um, so that's nice to it's it's I think it's yeah. easier to do it the other way. Like if I said take this graph and, do the and find the derivative, yeah. you can kind of go, oh it goes to zero there, boom, right? And it goes to zero there. Yeah. Integrating it is a little yeah. but you get the idea. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Doing well. <laughs> okay.